Satisfying God's great commandments. There's an insert in your bulletin. There's not a lot to fill in on the page this time because I wanted you to have the quotes that we're going to show on the screen in a little bit and let you know that you kind of get to take it easy on note-taking this week. But if you want to take notes, you can flip your page over. If there's room on the bottom, then you can make some notes there. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon the word, your anointing upon it. Bring life to it. Let the Spirit of God anoint these words that I'm about to speak that I feel like have come from you. And we just pray a blessing upon the word. May it accomplish the purpose where to it is sent. That's what you said in Isaiah. Your word will not go forth void, but it will accomplish the purpose where to it is sent. So we pray that you would accomplish that today. We pray that you'd give souls into the kingdom, that you'd convict men and women of their sin, young boys and girls, convict them of their sin and bring them into the body of Christ today. We give you glory for it and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's read the scripture first. From, Matthew, from Mark, chapter 12, verse 28 through 34. And I've been kind of hanging out around Mark and preached from Matthew a couple weeks ago or last week. I can't remember which one it was. But I've just kind of felt led to stay in Mark. And so we're coming from Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? That's a good question. Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must, read this aloud with me right here, read this off the screen. And you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally as important Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. You sound good. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. He shut it down. Now, there's times that we run into scriptures that we don't fully understand the meaning of the scripture that we've looked at. There are times I read the scripture and I think it's a little vague how we are to interpret that. And this is one of those passages that you kind of think you know, but you don't really know. Because it's understanding how to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength is not something that's readily comprehensible. It means kind of love God with everything that's within you, but there'll be some specifics we'll add to that later on. And it's not about legalism. It's not about works. It's about what does it really mean to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? And who is your neighbor? Those are valuable questions we need to answer today. So Jesus gives us two commandments in this passage, which is much easier to keep track of than the ten in the Old Testament that we couldn't keep anyway. He summarizes the ten into two. He gives us two commandments, and he calls these the greatest commandments. Love by the Lord thy God first, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's and equally as important as love your neighbor as yourself. So we want to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. First, love God first. Loving God first is the first and foremost and primary command as it should be. Why? A person hasn't fully experienced the greatest depth of love until he has come to Jesus and has who is love living inside of them. So people in the world don't really understand the level of love that we understand. Because we've experienced a greater measure of love than they can understand. Because they don't have Jesus. God is love. The Bible declares it plainly. And so to have God lead to have the maximum level of love in your life that you could possibly have. So loving God is the first and foremost primary command, and it should be. And those who live have love living inside of them have God. 
Those who have God have love living inside of them. Paul wrote to the Ephesians church and said, may, may you be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. To experience the love of God is to experience all the fullness of God. And so that's very important for us to understand. To begin your walk of love with God, you must believe in his son Jesus as the incarnate God in the flesh, the Messiah, Savior of the world, who died for our sin or our separation from God. Once you believe that, you can receive him unto yourself. Repent and confess that he is the son of God. The Bible tells us you do that, you're saved. A transformation occurs at that moment, a real love that can be felt and expressed out of your heart. I tell everybody I love you. Pretty much everybody I love you. And there's just not some I just skip it for some reason. It's not because I don't love them. I just don't think the most of the time I tell everybody I love you is I'm telling you goodbye. And that comes out of the love of Jesus in my heart. That's not phony. It's not fake. I care about you and I love you. That's real love. It's a deep love that's felt and expressed out of my heart because Jesus is in my heart. And he changed my life. He made me whole and he gave me love. So it's easy to pass that on. Why did Jesus answer the question the way he did regarding the love of God? He was quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 when he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. The complete biblical library commentary, and I'm going to read that to you in just a second, says that he was quoting the Shema, which in the Hebrew means hear, like hear with your ear. The Shema was quoted by every devout Pharisee twice a day, so the scribe, the teacher of the law, would have known what Jesus was quoting. So as soon as he said Shema, their ears popped up, perked up, because they knew where he was going. The Bible, complete, Bible, complete biblical library commentary reads like this. A commandment is only as binding as the authority of the one issuing it. Commandment is only as binding as the one issuing it has authority to make it so. The Shema stated both the uniqueness and the unity of Jehovah. He is unique in that there is no God beside him. But he's also unique in that he is a unity. The Greek term heis and the Hebrew ishad is singular in form but plural in meaning. God is not a unit but a unity. He's three in one. The triunity of God is implicit in the use of these terms. Even as Jesus was quoting the sermon, the Shema, he knew that he is God just as the Father is God and the Holy Spirit is God. And his listeners knew that he had told them that, and that he was God. He had given them every opportunity to love him as God. So Jesus was not only teaching them, he was teaching us and giving those who do not believe a chance to be saved. And those who did not believe he is the Son of God, they were given another opportunity to do so. Jesus helped this scribe to understand what God was commanding in the law. Listen to what the pulpit commentary says, and you have this on your page too. For many thought that the first commandment in the law related to offerings and sacrifices. That's the culture they were in. They were still in the Old Testament. So when he said what he said, they, they thought, well, maybe he's relating this to offerings and sacrifices, with which regard to which so much is said in Leviticus. That's an exciting book to read. <laughs> and that the right worship of God consisted in the due offering of these. So in other words, they, they figured worship was, the way we do worship was sacrifices and offerings. On this account, the Pharisees encouraged the children to say Corban. Now you need to know this. They encouraged the Pharisees to say Corban. And this is one of those things that's always been begged to me. I kind of understood it, but this gives me greater revelation of it. Corban to their parents. And hence, this candid and truth-loving scribe, when he heard our Lord's answer about the love of God and of our neighbor, said that such obedience was worth more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices that had been offered or could be offered. So sometimes we want to sacrifice to the Lord instead of obeying the Lord. We want to substitute something else rather than do or give the thing he's asking us to do or give. And that's not really what you want to do because you're operating under the law. You're offering a sacrifice instead of obedience. But what Jesus said, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, then everything that you're doing is greater than all the prophets combined. 
all the commands combined. With regards to the love of God, St. Bernard, I know it's hard not to picture a dog. (laughs) St. Bernard says the measure of our love to God is to love him without measure. For the immense goodness of God deserves all the love that we can possibly give to him. That's a good quote. Before we can go on, we're going to find out what Corbin is. What does it mean? How does it apply? Because Jesus condemned the Pharisees for encouraging this practice. Corbin. Translate, I don't know how to say the word, doron is what I think it says. Translated a gift, a sacrificial offering. Literally that which is brought near, namely to the altar. So you bring this as a worship sacrifice to God. An expression frequently used in the original text of the Old Testament. In the English Bible, it occurs in Mark 7, 11. Compare that also with Matthew 15, 5. It is the most general term for a sacrifice of any kind. In the course of time, it became associated with an objectionable, objectionable practice. Anything dedicated to the temple by pronouncing the votive word Corban forthwith belonged to the temple, but only ideally. Actually, it might remain in the possession of him who made the vow. What a deal. You can go to the temple, offer a gift, and get it back. And they call that Corban. So a son might be justified in not supporting his old parents simply because he designated his property or a part of it as a gift to the temple. That is Corban. That is Corban. So... In the Bible, you're commanded to care for your elders. That was the custom, the culture. As people aged, there was no social security. There was no dependence on the government. It was simply a matter of family took care of family. That's what we did today. Family took care of family with the offering that you brought. Family takes care of family. So for this to be a practice of the church in the Old Testament times, under the leadership of the Pharisees, was an atrocity in the eyes of God. There was no necessity of fulfilling his vow. If a guy brought something into the altar and said, this is going to be Corban, it meant meant something about that. There's no necessity of fulfilling, fulfilling his vow. Yet he was actually prohibited from ever using the property for the support of his parents. So he gets to retain it, but he couldn't use it for the support of his parents, which totally bypassed the intent of Scripture. This shows why God, clearly why Christ singled out this queer regulation in order to demonstrate the the sophistry, the sophistry. You can read it. (laughs) And tradition, and to bring out the fact of its possible and actual hostility to the scripture and its spirit. It's the antithesis of what God designed. We're going to take care of our family. We're going to minister to our parents and our old parents, meaning grandparents and great-grandparents. We're not to neglect them. We're to care for them. And that's what we would do at any level of Christianity. If you're a new believer or if you're an old believer, that's who we are. Jesus taught the scribe and us the love of God will manifest in your life in these two ways. You'll show it by loving God with every bit of your essence, Every bit of who you are. Read this out loud with me. And take notes on this. You want to write this down. All your heart, sincerity, soul, feeling or warmth into it, mind, intelligence, and strength, intensity into it. Now, I read that kind of fast, so you can write it down, so I'll go through it slowly. All your heart. That's everything within your heart. You are sincerely loving God with everything that's in you. It's not casual. It's not flippant. It's determined. You put energy into it. You love him with all your heart. You you sincerely love God. It's a deep level of love. And then you love him with all your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, or your feelings of warmth. So you're going to love him with your soul, which means you're going to love Jesus intently, passionately, exclusively. You're going to dedicate your life to him, and your love belongs to him, and you're going to feel the warmth of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you're going to extend that same warmth to God. Your mind 
intelligence. You're going to love God with all your intelligence. So you're going to pray over the Bible when you read it and ask God to give you revelation. You're going to serve him with your mind. You're going to be the best teacher you know how to be. You're going to be the best servant of God you know how to be. You're going to let your mind be used for the kingdom of God. Some of you have great minds. Some of you are still working on it. I won't tell you which ones. But we've got to love him with all our mind, all our intelligence. You're smart enough to figure out what's going on in the world. You're smart enough to follow politics and know nobody knows what they're doing there. Actually, they do know what they're doing. That's the scary part. But you're smart. God's given you intelligence. You have the ability to reason. You have opposable thumbs. No one else in the culture, no animal in the culture has opposable thumbs. That's why we can do things the animals cannot do. They can't reason like we can reason. We're separate. We're above the animal kingdom. We're created in the image of God. So it makes us unique. So we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, all of our intelligence, and then all our strength. And strength here means intensity. We're intensely serving God. We're intensely loving Jesus. We're intensely, intensely passionate about God. So we will never back up. We'll never back down. We'll serve him with everything that we are. You won't love a little bit, but everything that's in you will love God. Everything that's within you. So doing that, in doing so, we are obeying the greatest commandment. So if you've never really put a handle, got a handle on what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you think it's something that you have to do to satisfy some legalistic requirement, it's really not. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength will move you beyond legalism. It'll move you beyond saying, well, I've got to do this to serve Jesus. Because you'll serve him with all your heart, and you'll do the right thing anyway. And then that way you're obeying the greatest commandment. Perhaps this will help some of you deal with spiritual self-degradation. Because I hear you. I hear myself sometimes. Get on myself because I don't think I'm doing good enough or enough enough. And you do the same thing. I've heard you do it. Spiritual self-degradation is not where God wants you to live. He doesn't want you beating yourself up because you don't think you're doing things right or at least you're not as good as some others that you see. You'd suffer by comparison. Listen, your walk is your walk with Jesus. So follow him and get close to him and let him guide you, connect him to, to a deeper level, connect you to a deeper level in Jesus Christ. And then don't worry about other people. You help other people, but you don't have to be compared to somebody else. You are you. Be yourself. We like you. We love who you are. We want you to be yourself. I told Pastor Rachel many times, you be you. You be yourself. Don't let anybody take that away from you in ministry. Because in my early years of ministry, they did take that away from me. Because I tried to be somebody I wasn't. There were demands placed upon me that I felt were un- unnecessary and, and oppressive. So I've just decided I'm going to be who I am. Because God loves me, and God even likes me. And he loves and likes you too. And that doesn't come out of legalism, that comes out of relationship. So who you are in Jesus Christ is who you are right now. Do you have room for growth? Every one of us does. So we want to serve him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. That means we're going to have to put some effort into studying what it means to be like God and what it means to love our neighbors as ourselves. We get on ourselves because we don't think we're doing it right. Stop all that. Stop condemning yourself. Jesus knows you're not perfect. I hope that's a clue for some of you to relax a little bit. Because you're not perfect. He's the only one who's perfect. We strive to be like him, but we're not there yet. Are you loving God to the fullest extent of you? All your heart, soul, mind, and strength can bring to God. Are you loving him in that way? If so, then you are fulfilling the greatest commandment. Peace be unto you, my brother and sister. Relax. Don't relax your intensity, but take the pressure off of you because God's not condemning you as like you're condemning yourself. And if others condemn you and they're wrong and you know they're wrong, Don't pay attention to what they do. Don't get their voice down in your head. 
Don't give them rent-free occupancy. Take it out of that realm. Second, love people. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what about that? Now, what does that mean? Because some of you don't even like your neighbor. But I don't love them. Well, that was supposed to be funny. It bombed. <laughs> some of you don't even like yourself, let alone love yourself. So let me tell you something. You are, you are worthy to be loved. You are worthy to be saved. You are worthy to be liked. You're worthy to love and give love. It's in you. Because Jesus is in you. The second, Jesus said, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Sometimes people can be annoying. We were going down Morton Avenue yesterday, and for some reason, both people that were in front of us felt like 30 miles an hour was sufficient. And they had the road blocked, and everybody was doing 30 miles behind them. I know. Tested my patience. The sidewalks are forbidden, so I couldn't get around them. <laughs> Sometimes people can be irritating. They could go 35, but that's I guess it's too bright of a day or something. Some people can be annoying. Some people can be confusing. Some people can be hard to deal with. That's all of us at times. How do we live this out? How do you love people as you love yourself? We can't offer the same level of love to people that we offer to God because that would be idolatry. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 12, I'm going to read it to you in three different versions. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It's everything wrapped up in the law and prophets that Jesus was talking about when he gave us the two great commandments. Matthew in the New Living Translation reads, do to, others, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. The message version. Here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. You want to live the law out? You want to avoid legalism and just live the law out? Jesus summed it up in two great commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people like you want to be treated. I really don't believe the word neighbor means our immediate neighbor, although it doesn't exclude them either. But it's not solely your literal neighbors who live next door to you that this is referring to. And this is a deeper level of understanding for me on this than it was before I studied this. It is people we are to love. And we, we know that. We know that kind of casually. But how does it play out in real life? One surefire way to do that is to love them the way that you love yourself, the way you'd treat yourself or the way you'd want to be treated. When I need help and someone comes to my aid, I should do the same for others when so called upon. That's what it means to love my neighbor. So my neighbor's not just my neighbor. My neighbor's anybody that needs help. I'm to take care of them, stop and help them, because that's what I want somebody to do for me. So if you're on the road and somebody's needing to change a tire and you can get to them and help them, then that's what you'd want somebody to do for you, then do that. When I need help and someone comes to my aid, I should do the same for others in the same way, or another way, whenever they need aid. That is loving your neighbor in action. In doing so, we are obeying the second greatest command of all. Also in doing this, we fulfill all the law and the prophets. Who is my neighbor? In Luke 29, Jesus told this story to this question. Who is my neighbor? He told the story of a man who had been robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Three people passed by a man who had been injured. He was beat up, robbed, left for dead on the highway. A priest came by and crossed over to the other side. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. You can think of a priest as maybe your local pastor in today's terminology. Crossed over to the other side of the road to avoid helping the man. 
a Levite, the assistant pastor, <laughs> didn't do much better. He is temp- he's a temple assistant who walked over and looked at the man and then went on by. See, my wife would never do that. We were, I never, I've told you this before, but some of you knew it, you, you've never heard it. We were in Asheville, Tennessee with uh, some of our family. And we, I never saw the guy. We walked by some music stores, and we were looking at guitar shops and down that street that has the Hard Rock, Cuff, hard rock Cafe and all the things across from the, the, the center. I can't remember the name of the center. But in the stoop of one of the doorways was this huddled mass covered by blankets or coat or blanket or something like that. And Rollins stopped in her tracks and started to cry, and she was upset. I said, what's going on? And she pointed, and I had never even seen the guy until then. So she's very, really very sensitive to people who are in that level of need. And we should all be, because that's our neighbor. Jesus continued, then a despised Samaritan came along. Now, Samaritans were despised because they were half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Gentile. So the, the pure Jews wouldn't have anything to do with them. They were scumbags in their eyes. They were half Gentile, half Jew, and so they were extremely prejudiced against them. But it was the Samaritan who rescued the man. So, instead of doing what they should do as godly people, the priest and the Levite walked away and left the job to be done by a sinner. Because Jews were considered in the family. They were blood, according to Abraham's descent line, they were the bloodline of Jesus Christ. So the priest should have stopped and the Levite should have stopped and helped the young man out that was robbed and left for dead. They didn't. They left it for the one who, in the eyes of the Jewish race, was not worthy to be a Jew. In other words, he wasn't saved, he was a sinner. Who is my neighbor? The despised Samaritan came along and was the neighbor to that person. They were extremely prejudiced against the Jews. The, the Samaritans, were, the Jews were extremely prejudiced against them. And it was the Samaritan who rescued the man. He medicated his wounds. He put him on his own donkey. You ever have somebody want to get in your car and you don't want them to get in the car because they stink? They smoke. They haven't had a bath in two weeks. The body over is is difficult. The home they live in smells terrible. These are things our people have dealt with through the years as we've transported people in. They've lovingly handled those situations very well because they've loved the kids they were bringing in and ministering to. So he medicated his wounds. He put him in his own car. He proceeded to a local inn where he purchased a room for the man, but that's not all he did. The next day, the Samaritan left enough money for the man to be cared for until he was well, along with a promise to cover any additional expense upon his next visit. Then Jesus asked, Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Go and do the same. Go and do likewise. That's the command of the Lord. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love your neighbor as yourself. And that zeroes in for me on the definition of who is my neighbor. It's anybody that needs me. At the moment they need help. We're taught in the book of the Lord. I can't remember the exact reference, but... If you know somebody, it's in the book of James, I believe. But if you know somebody needs help and assistance, or it's a proverb, don't turn them away. If you have the ability to help them, then you should help them right then. Why? That's loving your neighbor as yourself. So think about people that you know who might need something, have a need that has not been met, and you have the ability to meet it, then you can meet that need. And there'll be a great blessing in your life for it, I'm sure. Now, this is your fill in the blank. If we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we love our neighbor as ourselves, we satisfy the great commandment. 
And that's what I was searching for as I looked at this word. How do I satisfy the great commandment? How do I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? What do those four words mean? And then who is my neighbor? Because if you remember, Cain and Abel, Cain was mad at God because he, let, he didn't like Abel's sacrifice. Because Abel's sacrifice came from the heart. It was the best of the money he had that crop come in, and he gave it to the Lord. And Cain was jealous because he offered a less than perfect offering. And he ended up killing Abel. And God came looking for Abel. He said, Cain, what have you done? Where's Abel? I don't know. Am I, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, you are. Because your brother is your neighbor. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what age they are. If they need help, we can supply it then we need to help our neighbors and become the epitome of the second great command, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. The scribe who questioned Jesus, Jesus said to him, realizing how close he was to the kingdom of God, said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're this close to breaking through to the person that you can be if you come to me and surrender your life. The scribe who questioned Jesus understood that to love God first and then love your neighbor as yourself was a summary of the complete Old Testament. It's everything Jesus came to set up. For a lost soul to understand this means they're very close to the kingdom of God, very close to salvation. Jesus told him, you're close. You're really close. And you shouldn't be because you're a Pharisee. And you guys don't think right. But you, young man, you seek truth. And today you've heard it and you found it. You're so close. You've got a good heart. You've got a good read on Scripture. And you understand what you're doing and what you're saying. You'll break through shortly. That means they're very close to salvation. Are you close today? I know everybody in the room just about. I know your relationship with God is good and healthy, many of you. Some of you may be struggling a little bit. Some of you may not know the Lord. We talked about in our Sunday school class this morning briefly how there's a new term for Christians who are Christians in name only. They claim the name of Christ, but their lives don't live out like a Christian. This term is called crino, C-H-R-I-N-O, Christian in name only. We don't want you to be a crino. We want you to be saved, close to God, loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. If you're here today and you're hurting, or you need to give your heart to Jesus, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He loves you and he wants you in his kingdom. If you're here today in person or watching online and haven't given your heart to Jesus, you can do it in these next few moments as we pray. We'll go ahead and tell our TV audience, our streaming audience, goodbye. Thank you for watching.